Are you making a DIY hair mask again? Yeah, and that's why your hair is so long, isn't it? Hello and welcome to the Queendom. I'm Sarah Ingle and this is your science-based guide to growing long hair. If you're struggling to find good information out there, it's because a lot of the stuff out there is just trash. If you Google how to grow long hair, you'll get articles from gossip magazines, bloggers with no sources or credentials, or companies trying to sell you something. Sources that I used to think were credible, turns out, have skewed, misleading, or flat out wrong advice. Most of this guide comes from an 800 page hair physics and chemistry textbook. Most of it is not pleasant reading, but I have spent weeks pouring over this every day just to condense this for you guys into the only science-based long hair guide that I have ever seen. So if you're ready to bust some myths and find out what it really takes to get your hair long, let's get started. In order to understand what can make your hair long, we need to talk a little bit about how hair grows. The four phases of hair growth are anagen, the growing phase, catagen, the transitioning or shrinking of the follicle phase, telogen, the resting phase, and exogen, the shedding phase. The one that you wanna remember is the anagen phase, that growth phase. In order for your hair to be growing, it has to be in this phase. Most people's hair on average grows about six inches per year and can grow their hair to be around three feet long, provided that they don't cut it or damage it too much. Fun fact about that is one of the studies that helped determine that was done at Disney World. One myth that I wanna bust right now is that you need your hair to grow fast for it to get long. In 1988, there was a woman named Diane Witt, and at the time she was listed in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the world's longest hair. A Worcester, Massachusetts resident says she enjoys her hair so much so that it's grown to be the longest in the world, measuring nearly 10 feet. No plans on cutting it right now. We'll take it one step at a time. Even though it takes her four hours to dry and her husband has to help her carry it around, Four years later, they measured it again and it was 12 feet long. Even though she had the longest hair, her hair did not grow any faster than average. What was unique for Diane was that her antigen phase, that growth phase, lasted over 20 years. And she also didn't cut it and it didn't break off. One question you might wonder is, was her hair healthy? Probably not by your hairdresser's standards, but it was healthy enough not to break. So your two keys to very long hair are making your hair stay in that growth phase as long as possible and keeping your hair from breaking off. That means there are trade-offs. Do you want perfectly healthy hair? Do you want long hair? Do you wanna style your hair a lot? Let's first talk about how to make your hair stay in the growth phase longer. Both hair loss, when people's hair starts to thin, and length of hair are tied to the growth phase. On average, for most people, hair grows for two to six years. It is completely normal for your hair to shed some. That is just part of the cycle of hair. In adult female Caucasians ages 18 to 35, the hair sheds about 100 hairs a day, Asian hair sheds about 70 hairs a day, and African hair sheds about 60 hairs a day. If you're malnourished and you're not getting all the nutrients that you need, it's gonna mess up your hair growth cycle and you're going to lose hair, which is why hair gummies can kind of make the claims that they do. The vitamins that are in hair gummies typically are things that are shown if you're deficient in them, it can make you lose hair. Nothing about it says it makes your hair grow any faster. Most people are not deficient in the things that are in hair gummies, and most of the stuff that's in hair gummies is also in a multivitamin. They're just charging you 10 times as much and putting it in pretty packaging. In my opinion, a lot of hair gummy advertising is shady because it doesn't really do what they're implying that it does. I even highlighted something in my chemistry and physics of hair textbook that says no vitamins have been proven to make hair grow faster or longer. There are a lot of things about the hair growth cycle that we still don't understand, but we do know that it has a lot to do with hormones. Hormones are so intertwined with your hair growth cycle that pregnant women's hair tend to stay in the growth phase longer. And I think that's also why a lot of people have this idea that prenatal vitamins make hair grow. And it's not actually the prenatal vitamins, it's the fact that the hormones that happen during pregnancy make people's hair stay in the growth phase longer. 
The shedding rate also typically goes way up after they have their baby. Their hair tends to shed like crazy. Shedding rate also increases with age, especially with men. There's even a little bit of variation with the time of year. And an easy way to remember that is that there's more hair fall in the fall. So how do you get your hair to stay in that growth phase longer? There are chemicals that we know make the hair growth phase last longer. You usually find those in products like Rogaine that are meant to stop hair loss. The second you stop it, the product stops working. If you have thinning hair and you stop using it, all of that hair is going to fall out. And there's also a lot of good evidence to support laser LED therapy. They make little helmets that you can wear. Usually laser LED therapy is is meant to help people with hair loss. But technically, if it is helping your hair stay in that growth phase longer, it could potentially, when you're dealing with really long lengths of hair, make your hair grow longer than it would otherwise. For most people, it is not the length of your growth phase that is sabotaging your long hair journey. It's your hair is breaking off. In order to understand how to keep your hair from breaking off, we have to talk a little bit about the structure of your hair. You're going to want to understand the cuticle. The cuticle are like clear scales on the outside of your hair that protect everything on the inside of the hair shaft. Like shingles on a house, they're overlapping. And the cuticle is your protection barrier. And the cuticle differs dramatically between different races and hair types. Asian hair typically has the most layers of skin Scales, Caucasian hair has fewer layers and African hair typically has the fewest layers of cuticle scales. More layers means more protection and the more you open the cuticle, the more you wear down your protection. So you want to avoid products with high pH levels like bleach and even many shampoos because they lift open the cuticle scales leaving the hair extra vulnerable to damage. Another piece of the puzzle is the cross section shape. So if you think of your hair as a big long noodle and you chop it and you look at the this circle-y part, that's a cross section. Asian hair tends to be the most perfectly round in a cross section. Then Caucasian is still pretty round, but it's a little bit more elliptical. And African hair tends to be the most elliptical. Because Asian hair has the most layers of cuticle and it is the most perfectly round hair shaft, it tends to be more resistant to damage on multiple levels, on from pulling, twisting, even chemicals. And it also makes it harder to bleach. African hair is on the opposite extreme. It has fewer layers of cuticle and because of the elliptical shape and the curl pattern the cuticle scales don't fit together as uniformly so the hair is much more susceptible to breakage. So if you want to know how strong your hair is, there's a term called tensile strength and it's basically how strong is something when you pull on it and is it going to break. So they have machines that basically can pull on hair and see how many times it can pull before the hair snaps. With Caucasian hair, it's about 35,000 times. African hair is about 5,500 times. And for African relaxed hair, it is only 550 times before the hair snaps. Until recently, a lot of the major brands did not have products that properly address the needs of African hair. There is so much to say on this topic, but I think that it warrants its entire own video. All of the studies that I've seen have broken down hair into Asian, Caucasian, and African. I don't know why those are the only three that tend to be tested. You know your hair best. You can probably figure out which of those three categories your hair is closest to if you don't feel like you fit into one of those groups. But one of the main things I want you to take away from this is that different types of hair have different needs. Try not to compare your hair to other people's hair. And I would highly recommend that you get hair advice from somebody who understands that your hair has different needs than somebody else's hair. Otherwise, they could have be giving you great advice that works for them that might not work for you. And that's one of the dangers of YouTube is unless someone is very clearly citing your sources and you're checking that they're actually uh, understand how to read and interpret those sources, people could potentially give you bad advice. So depending on what type of hair you have, you understand that it is, can be more or less susceptible to damage. So we're gonna try and hone in on some things that can help you reduce damage to your hair. The main thing that is breaking your hair is actually you when you're brushing it. Some of the treatments or heat styling we do does make it more fragile and damages the cuticle, but the actual breaking usually happens with brushing and combing. So when you're combing or brushing your hair, and if you come to a tangle, go below that tangle 
and keep brushing your way up until you work out the tangle that way. It's gonna cause so much less breakage than the yanking. And here's one I'd never heard of before. You are more likely to get split ends with a blunt haircut versus a tapered haircut. There's a term called end peak force, which is basically just how much force is pulling on your hair when you're brushing it. End peak force is four times higher for blunt haircuts than for tapered haircuts. And because of that, the number of split ends increase three times when you're combing your hair if you have a blunt haircut versus a tapered haircut. Combs and brushes with more space between the teeth or bristles lead to fewer and less complex tangles, and it lowers that combing force so it causes less abrasion and fewer broken hairs. I have learned so much about different types of ways that the hair breaks, different types of split ends, whether wet or dry or comb or brush is better. So I really think we're gonna need an entirely separate video just on split ends and hair breakage. But for now, I'm just gonna just give you more tips that you can use to keep your hair from breaking. A lot of people with really curly hair will always say, oh my goodness, I'm not gonna brush my hair because it poofs out and it's just a mess. Not only does it often poof out your hair, if you have highly coiled hair, combing it wet actually breaks the hair less than combing it dry. But the opposite is true if you have wavy to straight hair. If you have wavy to straight hair, you're more likely to get breakage when your hair is wet, which is so important. If you have curly hair, highly coiled hair, go to someone who specializes that and understands that. Everyone, whether you have curly hair, straight hair, wavy hair, all of the above or anything in between. You need to be using conditioner or detangler when combing and brushing. I think that's something we all already knew, but here's what really convinced me. So for virgin hair, usually it has a lifespan of 55.2 million brush strokes, which is a lot. That exact same hair after conditioning it increases it to 1.04 billion brush strokes. Most hair breakage does happen while you're brushing, but that doesn't mean to avoid brushing or combing altogether. Most of that brushing or combing breakage that happens is because the hairs are tangled. So it's a little bit of a balance here. You need to brush it enough that you're not letting the hair get too tangled in the first place, but then also just be careful when you are brushing it because that is when the overwhelming majority of breakage happens. In addition to these, a quick list of things that you can do to avoid breaking your hair. You're probably familiar with a lot of these already, but these are all ones backed by science. First of all, don't bleach your hair. This is obviously what I don't follow. If you really, really want long hair, don't bleach it. And because I do bleach my hair, I have to be extra careful with a lot of these other ones to avoid breaking it. Avoid heat styling. Make sure you're using UV protection. Putting your hair into some sort of loose braid or protective style before bed and a silk bonnet and or pillowcase. Also, when you do have those protective hairstyles, I recommend switching up either where you secure your hair or switching up the actual hairstyle so that you're not constantly pulling on your hair in the exact same place. Do not use high pH hair products. Also, don't wash your hair every day. Not only is the water breaking bonds in your hair, the actual scrubbing of the hair does do a lot of damage to it. Even at the top of your head, you are roughing up that cuticle and causing little bits of damage over time. Use conditioner if you're using shampoo. Personally, I don't use shampoo anymore. I use a product called New Wash. I've talked about it a lot in other videos, so I'll link to some of those in the description. But if you are using a shampoo, make sure it's one with a low pH. Make sure you use a shower filter, especially if you live in an area with very hard water. Make sure you're securing your hair before exercising or be before being in the wind. Silk or satin hair elastic. Avoid pool water, chlorine is very bad for your hair. Be careful with blow drying, even with cool air. It's a great place for people to wind up with tangles. Oh, and if you're blow drying with a brush, you also definitely need to be careful because brushing is where breaks happen. If you want long, healthy hair, do not tease your hair. When I saw under a microscope, what happens when you tease your hair? It straight up breaks off huge sections of your cuticle. One to watch out for if you have very coily hair, twisting is extra bad. You're way more likely to get breakage. Definitely avoid chemical straighteners and relaxing that is 
horrible for the health of your hair. Even if it looks pretty and doesn't look frizzy, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthy. As we showed in that graph a while back, relaxing your hair really compromises the strength of your hair. If you really want to go off the deep end, if you can sleep so you're not moving your hair so much and rubbing your hairs against each other, technically that will help, but it's very difficult to control what you're doing during your sleep. This one I know is gonna be controversial, but avoid DIY hair treatments unless you really, really know what you're doing. At least measure the pH and make sure that it's in like a decent range. And even still, most of the ingredients in your fridge are not processed into small enough little bits to actually get into your hair and do any good. I think a lot of the DIY treatments are either a waste of time and you're just making your hair goopy and in some cases, potentially damaging to it, especially if it involves baking soda. <laughs> Uh, I want to touch on shampoo a little bit more because it's the one thing where I don't really trust a lot of what the beauty industry is throwing at us. Especially after reading this textbook, they will flat out say that shampoo tends to be very damaging, especially ones that have a very high pH. When companies do research, usually the number one thing that is prioritized is customer satisfaction, which sounds good. They want us to like what we're buying. Here's where it gets tricky. The number one thing that they've tested makes us feel like our hair is being cleaned and determines customer satisfaction is lathering. How much does it suds up? How much does it lather when we're shampooing our hair? It makes us feel like we're getting our hair cleaner and the more it lathers, the higher the customer satisfaction score is. However, the lathering has nothing to do with cleaning your hair. There was a sentence I highlighted in the textbook that says, for pragmatic financial reasons, insufficient blind tests are generally conducted to determine discernibility because the bottom line is sales, not objective understanding. It's tricky. If a company makes something and customers try it out and they're like, oh, I don't like this, and they really believe that it's not getting their hair clean, but it actually is, they're not gonna sell any of it. And they'll literally have people like yelling at them on Twitter or on their Instagram feed, be like, this stuff doesn't work, even if it does. I'm just very curious to see the more that this information gets out to people, if we start to see more companies doing what customers know might theoretically be better for their hair, even if it doesn't feel as good. All of that being said, Long hair isn't everything. It is not practical or even emotionally healthy to try and live in such a way that your hair isn't touched. You do not have to do everything on that list. I want you to be informed so you can make the best decisions for you. Please try not to compare your hair to other people's. We all have different genetic makeup. You just work on your own hair journey and we can all be on a journey together, whatever our goal is, and not comparing our hair to one another. And you know what? If you want long hair, but you still wanna style it a lot or do all these things to it, extensions are always an option for people too. This is just to inform you so that you can make the best decisions for you. Not anybody else, you. When we started last year on this journey to find the best and worst hair advice, I had no idea I was gonna be diving this much into chemistry, physics, and like learning so much about hair. Even just throughout this video, future videos that I know that I want to make and dive more into things, split ends and breakage, race and hair, hair loss and hair thinning, and also just where to get good beauty info. So if you wanna see those, remember to subscribe and ring the little bell so you don't miss those. Also, I want you guys to tell me in the comments below if your hair could be any length, you didn't have to work harder, have to worry about breaking any length, how long would you want your hair to be? Shout out today to Megan Westcomb. I'm so glad that you find my videos helpful. Anyway, this is your ultimate guide on how to grow long hair. I hope you geeked out on it as much as I did, and I will see you next time. How's my hair look? I don't know. I can't see my head. I can't see my head. There's some on my head, there's my mouth, my mom, 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 mom.